Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Temple University and the Fox School of Business. I'm Ron Anderson, Dean at the Fox School, and also Dean at our sister school, the School of Sport, Tourism, and Hospitality Management. <clears throat> I want to thank you for being here, and I want to give a special thanks to Ambassador Ron Kerr for sharing his time, his experience, and his expertise with us. And thank you to the World Affairs Council for recognizing the value of these opportunities. For the Fox School, events like these are right at the core of who we are, putting practitioners together with academics in support of one another, and putting tomorrow's leaders in the same room to put today's leaders. My colleagues and I are grateful to host these opportunities put together by the World Affairs Council of Philly. The event provides so much value to our students, to our faculty, to our staff, alumni, and to all of our stakeholders. The World Affairs Council and our Center for International Business Education and Research, that is our cyber program here at the Fox School of Business, and our entire curriculum go hand in hand. New and emerging markets, as well as new technologies and political realities, continue to drive global commerce. And in that chaos of change, it is essential for political leaders, business leaders, researchers, educators, students to collaborate to find solutions. We envision the Fox School as a place for innovative education and leading research. And we also envision ourselves as change makers for our community, including the international business community. The topic of today is global trade, war or peace. This evening, former US Ambassador Ron Kerr, someone who is very well versed in global trade, is going to provide us with insights regarding the landscape of global commerce. Very much looking forward to his remarks. Before I invite Ambassador Kirk and Craig Snyder to get started here, though, I do want to welcome Craig Snyder, who is the president and CEO of the Philadelphia chapter of the World Affairs Council. Craig has been a political candidate, chief of staff to Senator Arlen Specter, a lobbyist, and a political consultant. His knowledge of legislative and foreign affairs, as well as his passion for promoting civil discourse, serve him as well as head of the Philadelphia chapter. Craig, I throw it over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dean. Um, I want to, uh, as always, uh, acknowledge uh, with gratitude our uh, partnership uh, with uh, the Fox School of Business and with Temple University. Um, it not only uh, facilitates uh, programs like uh, we're hoping tonight, uh, but also Council's regional uh, simulation programs for high school students, uh, which are really uh, marvelous uh, region-wide gatherings uh, of high school students uh, from public, private, independent, city, suburban schools, uh, and uh, we're, we're really proud that uh, we're able to do those in this wonderful facility. Um, as uh, the Dean noted, uh, we gathered this evening to discuss uh, one of the thorniest issues, really, both in terms of U.S. politics and in terms of world affairs, uh, and we are very delighted uh, to be joined uh, for uh, that discussion uh, by one of our country's uh, leading experts on this issue, uh, Ron Kirk, uh, the 16th United States Trade Representative. Uh, Mr. Kirk uh, served in that role uh, under President Obama from 2009 to 2013. Uh, we have uh, much uh, to, uh, to cover. Uh, and I want to get to some questions, obviously, from, uh, from this audience. Uh, so uh, let me ask you just to, to join Ambassador, uh, to welcome me in, in joining uh, in, uh, Ambassador Ron Kerr. So, uh, Mr. Ambassador, let me just start by giving you the opportunity uh, to make whatever uh, opening remarks you, you, you'd like. Um, there's, trade is, is one of a very short list of things that some days or some hours of some days pushes uh, the impeachment issue uh, off, of the, off of the news. Um, it, it has, in other words, it's a powerful and important issue. Uh, so uh, just want to turn it over to you to make any opening remarks you'd like. Well, first of all, my thanks to you and the World Affairs Council of Philadelphia for uh, inviting me here, Mike. I don't, I don't know if he was being protective or deliberately uh, leaving out of my introduction that I was the mayor of Dallas. 
uh, for seven years. <laughs> Even this sweet lady I met who took pictures with me, made me take selfies, then I meant something about the cowboys. And she immediately was like, oh no, that won't do. But anyway. I was, trying, I was trying to get you out of here safely. But. <laughs> no, thank you uh, for having me here, Dean. What a, what a fabulous uh, new campus you've got. And even I could sort of figure out that you are highlighting your, I pre presume, connections to these cities around the world from Cairo to Beijing to Sydney to Paris and Rome and others. Uh, but more so than looking at the pictures on the wall, I'm just looking at the makeup of the audience uh, and the fact there are students here uh, that look like they come from all four corners of the world, not just from all over the United States. Uh, Craig was a bit generous in his introduction as, as credentialing me as an expert on trade. I don't know that it was much of an expert as I was a practitioner. My introduction to the importance of global affairs came after my, I was elected mayor of Dallas in 1996, which was just after NAFTA had gone into effect. And for most of Dallas's then 150 year history, we were a city that sort of bemoaned that we had been defied by a tragic event that had nothing to do with our city uh, but we were also a little bit jealous of the fact that notwithstanding the television show, there's not a bunch of all Derricks around Dallas. We were the largest city in North America, over a million people, that didn't have a navigable body of water. Uh, as I would say to visitors, nobody moves to Dallas to be near the mountains and the ocean. And we were sort of the finance um, business capital of Texas until this thing called NAFTA came along. And previous to that, 20 years before, we had built our port. Because all commercial business at the turn of the last century happened on seaports, then it moved to railroad stations, and then in this last century, you had to have a major airport. And all of a sudden, we had DFW Airport. And even in my, my non-mathematical mind, being both a lawyer and a politician, I could figure out, here's DFW Airport, here's Mexico, here's Canada, here's New York, here's Washington. Dallas, Texas is three and a half hours away from all of them. I thought we had been given this gift of being the centerpiece then of the largest commercial zone in the world. And in fact, Texas, Dallas benefited greatly from that. And so I took a very positive view of trade with me into my opportunity to serve President Obama as U.S. Trade Rep. And like most mayors, I would say this, whether you were listening to the mayor of Dallas, or Philadelphia, New York, if you were listening to the mayor of any of the 10, 12 largest cities in the country, one of the common denominators, his mayor spent a big part of their um, efforts in marketing their city internationally because we recognize when companies from around the world relocate to Philadelphia, to Houston, to Dallas, to Los Angeles, you are the beneficiaries of that. So I had a practical view of international economic affairs as a way to make our communities better, to keep jobs growing in parts of our cities where uh, we needed them and in a way to enhance our overall economic strength. Now I balanced that against the reality that I married this incredible woman that moved to Dallas to go in a career in banking. Dean, forgive me, she did not go to Temple. She went to Wharton as an undergrad. But she was an AB kid, ABC kid. I'd never heard of that. My wife grew up in Cleveland and Detroit. Very, very difficult circumstances. Uh, went through a program called the A Better Chance Program uh, that took inner city kids and paid for them to go to private boarding school. And that's how she ended up in war. But the important thing for this to shorten it is going back and forth to see my in-laws in Detroit, in Pittsburgh, in Cleveland, I realized not everybody viewed trade the way that I did. And so I brought with me both of those experiences into the challenge 
of helping President Obama fashion a trade agreement that would help us do two things. One, we inherited, uh, for some of you younger people, you may not remember, but when President Obama took office in November of, in, in uh, January of 2009, we inherit, inherited the worst economy since the Great Depression. And every member of the administration's job was to focus on how to get our economy going, how could we create jobs. And we believed trade could be a part of that formula because trade at its core is about taking the best of what we create, what we grow, what we manufacture in this country and sharing it with the world. And if you do that in the right way, the beneficiaries are the people who make those products here in the U.S. But to do that, a lot of times that means you've also got to import products. You've got to import components from places like China or Mexico or Latin America that strengthen our ability to sell what we're doing to the world. But we also recognized that we had to make a more honest argument to those that felt they had been harmed by trade that we would hold our trading partners accountable. Because most Americans get the bigger trade narrative. Um, I normally would ask audiences like this, how many of you shop online? But given the fact that we're on a college campus, uh, I'm guessing, do any of you go to the store anymore? If you run out of stuff, you just go on Amazon and order. Do you care where it comes from? Do you look? No. You look for the best product, the cheapest product, and if you can get it cheaper, faster, you get it. That is because of competition. One of the things trade does, it expands competition to a global universe so that governments get out of the way between you and your buying decisions. That's the, the, the real benefit of trade. The problem, the benefits are spread out so across the country that you just take for granted that you can find a cheaper iPad, laptop, makeup, you know, massage tool, whatever you want online. But when the factory that's making that in Pennsylvania is all of a sudden shuttered because somebody's doing it cheaper around the world, that picture goes on the front page of the paper. And you see the pain from that. It's very localized and very focused. So within all of that, we have to come up with a not gimmicky, but a sellable argument to the American public that one way to help get our economy growing is by being engaged in the and the mayor in me tried, I used to quote this so much, my, the, the, the kids who worked with me would roll their eyes, but my police chief used to always have simple sayings and I would steal them and try to appropriate them. But the one thing I'll do and then I'll stop is just never lose sight of the fact 95% of the world's consumers now live somewhere else. That's a clue. And they're gonna buy stuff. They have looked with envy at the way we live, the way we, we, we have the ability to enrich our lives uh, with envy for the last half century, but now they want to be a part of that equation. And they are going to buy those resources from someone. And if not from the United States, then they're going to get them from Europe, they're going to get them from China, they'll get them from Canada or Australia, or any of those other markets. And the way we stay in the game is by making sure we negotiate thoughtful trade agreements like the proposed Trans-Pacific Partnership that we negotiated that anchors us in those markets and gives us a chance to compete. So that's the broad case uh, and belief that I brought to the job uh, and the rest of it we'll talk about. And then since the title of this, and I wish it, it was a little hard, I thought, but it's, I think whether it's a trade war or peace, I would remind you, no two countries that have ever ended commercial partnership have gone to war. The one thing we know for sure, if people are making money, feeding their families, believing they're making a better lives, you find a way to resolve your conflicts without picking up a gun. That's a pretty good argument for trade. Thank you. So let's let's stick with NAFTA for, for a bit. Um, obviously in the 2016 campaign, uh, candidate Trump uh, promised to withdraw renegotiate and we do now have the, 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 uh, the makings of, of a deal uh, a 
I'd like to hear your sense of whether or not uh, the, the, the deal is better than NAFTA. Uh, was it a necessary uh, revision, a necessary improvement? And of course, also your sense of the prospects for actual passage by Congress. Yeah. And, I, and I, I promise you I'll spend all my talk looking back. But in fairness, I was appointed U.S. Trade Representative by a candidate who won the 2008 Democratic primary over Hillary Clinton with a commitment to redo NAFTA. And so had Hillary Clinton. So that's nothing new. Now here's the reality. Um, and I understand how we see trade. Um, it really depends on where you live. And, and I, I paint with very broad brushes. I tell my girls we hate stereotypes because they're all rooted in truth. But the reality is the Mississippi River has almost become a marginal line for how Americans think about NAFTA. If you think about it, for the most part, states, cities west of the Mississippi, the high-tech states, the ag states have benefited marvelously from NAFTA. Some of those east of the Mississippi, particularly the, the old Rust Belt, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Ohio, believe every shutter factor uh, is due to NAFTA, and the truth probably lies somewhere in between. I would argue a little less so. Uh, but one of the things that we did and forgive me, I try not to use acronyms. When we made a decision to join this effort called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which was a commitment among 12 economies anchored in the Asia Pacific to create what would be the largest multilateral trade zone in the world with the latest and best trade architecture as it related to intellectual property, digital trade, environmental responsibility, labor rights, many of which are being pushed singularly by the United States. And the United States, I mean the United States, when we made the agreement to become a part of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, worked very hard to get Mexico and Canada included in that. And so, since we're in the school, your homework would be to just Google TPP, you'll see the 11 countries, but many of these on the wall were a part of it. Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, Brunei, which I have to tell you, I think it's so cool, Brunei really does have a sultan. When I met him, I just couldn't help but go, this is the neatest thing in the world. But Chile, the United States, Mexico, Canada, Japan, we negotiated that agreement. So as a part of that, we have to negotiate what we call bilaterally with each of the, the 11 other countries so we had already basically brought NAFTA up to this century standards. And think about it, NAFTA went into effect now almost 25 years ago at the time. There was no such thing as Facebook. There was no digital commerce. There was no Amazon, eBay, none of that technology existed. So NAFTA needed upgrading. So to, to, to uh, Mike's question, what the administration did, one of the things President Trump committed was to rip up NAFTA, but also pull out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. We had concluded the negotiations on So I think that an honest case can be made what the administration brought forth as a new and improved NAFTA was basically pulling those components of NAFTA out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and putting, you know, a different fender on it and calling it new and improved. It did have stronger, um, um, arguably, labor protections and that it mandated, I think, a minimum $15 an hour wage for those involved in production of cars. But for the most part, it was what we would have gotten anyway within the Trans-Pacific Partnership. But the big leap behind is we walk away from access to those 10 other economies that are now going to do business without us. The easiest example I can give you is, I, I don't know how many of you travel internationally, but at least when my family does, the first thing my girls want to do is go to the duty-free um, the duty free store, because somehow we believe everything's cheaper. Well, we just negotiated and built the biggest duty-free store in the world. And then President Trump said, everybody can shop here but the United States. 
So all of those countries are going to wipe out tariffs from one another. We're going to continue to pay into those. And then Mexico and Canada are now uniquely positioned. As much as this president says he favors America first and he wants to strengthen American manufacturing, if you're an American and you want access to Vietnam's market and Singapore and Malaysia's market duty free, right now the practical effect of us being out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, in many cases you're going to pay tariffs anywhere from 35 to 120 percent, unless you just send those goods across the border and ship them out of Mexico and Canada. So, I, I mean, it's better than, than walking away from NAFTA, but at best, it preserves what we had, presuming that we can get it passed in this toxic environment, but it's still no substitute for what we would have gotten had we stayed within the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Well, I want to come back to TPP in one second, but just to sort of finish up on, on the Mexico Canada agreement. Uh, should Speaker Pelosi bring it up? Should it get a vote? You know, I would hope so. Um, but there's a lot that needs to be done. Trade is always a tough sell, uh, particularly for Democrats. You know, and, and I know this is a nonpartisan uh, venue, but because the the hard reality is all presidential elections feel like they come down to Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan. Florida, those are not state states in which being a having a, a progressive trade agenda is the path to winning your nomination. So for many Democrats, they have to take the best of neutral position on trade and a trade vote before a present, you know, uh, an election year is a very tough time. And, and even though uh, I know you referenced it somewhat tongue in cheek, uh, one of the challenges of impeachment is it just feels like it's sucking all of the other oxygen out of the air. And Washington um, is a fairly toxic environment as it is. Uh, and, and, and the US, Mexico, Canada agreements, not the only thing that's trying to be forced through that pipeline. So typically from this point on, we're at November 1st. You know, Congress may only be in session another 25 days. And so I'm encouraged that Speaker Pelosi said yesterday that she thought uh, that uh, they had resolved some of the outstanding issues some of the Democrats wanted to address to be able to move it forward, uh, but it remains to be seen whether we can get it done. I certainly hope so, because it is very important, and I'm biased. Uh, my state, Texas, is spectacularly the biggest beneficiary of our trade with Mexico. But just to put this in perspective, it's important uh, as potentially China and Africa and then Brazil. We do $3 billion of business with Mexico and Canada every day of the year. And these other markets are important, but spectacularly, our biggest, our most reliable trading partners are Mexico and Canada. And the fact that we have strengthened our hand in trading here is what also makes us more efficient when we look to go into these new markets around the world. So let's go back to TPP. You've obviously made the case uh, already uh, as to why you think it was the right way to go, why you think it was important and beneficial to the United States. But you've also pointed out the political realities. In this last campaign, neither candidate supported TPP. Uh, uh, Secretary Clinton also voiced her opposition. Uh, so. It, assuming that you're that you're right, that it was a good agreement, that it was in the interest of the United States, is there any way uh, that you believe the politics can be reoriented so that uh, a deal like that uh, is not opposed by both political parties? It will be difficult, but I believe it's going to happen for the simple reason that once we really are hit with the reality that we are now frozen out of this incredible market. Uh, that is one of the, and we don't pick these markets willy-nilly. Uh, I don't want this to sound too esoteric, but the, 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 the fundamental, we are in business school. The fundamentals of business have never changed. Now, it used to be before, again, the internet, interstate commerce, all business was the same. Location, location, location. Where do I cite my business that I'm closest 
to the largest number of people that can buy what I'm selling. And then when the internet came along for commerce and telecommunications, it made it possible for people to be able to access your business without being cited next to you. Uh, as a country, we are very deliberate in choosing markets that we want to pursue for trade agreements because we want to have countries to share our values as in terms of respecting intellectual property because we have a very innovative society. We're moving to a high level um, innovative information oriented economy and we have to be able to protect that. We want countries to share our values in terms of respect of workers, not abusing women or children and so on. But we also want countries that have a lot of people that are trying to move from a non-developed lifestyle to a more urban lifestyle that have a need to buy what we're selling. That's the prescription for a trade agreement that works for them, that works for us. So we deliberately picked this region in the Asia Pacific because most economists told us this would be the fastest growing market in the last, in the next 20 years. And if you think about it, most of the last century, global economic affairs was dominated by what's called the transatlantic partnership. We have a spectacular commercial relationship with Europe. Always had, always will. But to President Obama's credit, um, having both spent his formative years in Hawaii, but a big part of his life in Indonesia, not only in terms of commercial sense, but just in terms of his own being, he is a globalist. And he felt that we had not been nearly as aggressive in expanding and building on the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership the way that we had the Transatlantic Partnership. So for us, this made sense for reasons of our own values, of our own economic partnership. But there was also this reality that most of our relationships in the Asia and Pacific were strategic. We have army bases all over Korea and the Philippines because we've helped stabilize that part of the world after World War II. And we thought if we can have this strategic partnership, why shouldn't we have an economic partnership that elevates to that same level in which we both participate on a freer and fairer basis. And we've allowed those countries to put down their weapons by giving them access to our markets. It's the reason Japan has no army. After World War II, the, the deal with Japan was, how about if you stop making bombs and missiles, we'll let you make cars, and you know what, we'll let you sell them to us. Well, now it's our turn. We've helped to stabilize Europe, stabilize most of the Asia Pacific, we want to be able to enter those markets and sell freely to them. So I mean, that is why we felt that was so important. And now that we are locked out of that market, the pain is going to be real. Um, the one thing you know, the hardest customer for you to get back is the one you just lost. Um, I read too much. I read everything. I read trade stuff. I have to balance it by reading sports. I read arts because my daughter's a dancer. And then I just read all the crazy stuff I see in the news. So there's a story in the news today that an African-American family was visiting a restaurant over the weekend, celebrating some family event, having a great time, and they were asked to move because one of the white customers didn't want to be seen by a black man. So the sales clerk came over and told them they needed to move. And they were like, this doesn't make much sense. You can read this, you can't make this stuff up anymore. So then the manager comes over and says, oh, well, this table has been previously reserved. So at that point, the family's like, this bites. So they left. But as we do, and we have the power to do now, because every one of us is our own journalist, the guy's wife tweeted about it that night and put a picture of the store. And what do you think the likelihood of not only that family not going back to that store, but do you think other African-American families are going to feel welcome there? Well, it's the same thing in the trade world. We just abandoned all of our partners in Southeast Asia. Do you think they're going to hold their breath and not eat, not buy? You think they're going to write on tablets and not use iPads until we get our act together? No. They're going to find other venues, and they won't have to look for them. Because while the rest of the world says, oh, it's terrible the United States isn't here, they're also coming around the back door saying, 
You know, China, we've got soybeans. You know, Vietnam, we've got machinery. And the hardest customer to win back is the one you've pushed away and you've let walk out the door. And that's my concern, is that we have sent a signal, not only through trade, but because this administration has basically declared we don't believe in global partnerships. We pulled out of the Paris, we pulled out of the climate accords, we pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we don't think a lot about NATO, and so the world is beyond holding their breath waiting to see if the United States is going to engage. And other countries are rushing to fill that void. And I think when our businesses begin to really feel the pain of that, that's when they're going to go to Congress and say, we don't care if you're a Democrat or Republican, we have got to get back in the game. You mentioned China, which is obviously really at the, at the core of, uh, of discussions about trade uh, these days. Um, the phrase trade war is used all the time, every day, a million times a day, about the U.S. relationship with China at the moment. Um, do you think it's a fair characterization? Well, it's certainly a trade they talk about. And China is horribly complex, uh, but it's too big to ignore. Um, I've been privileged to serve on the board of a number of companies in the United States, from manufacturing to casual dining to consumer packaged goods. And at the core of every meeting, was dog cussing the state of California for how bad it is to do business there and you can't figure out the rules and add that. But if you would ever say, why don't we pull out? They look at you and go, are you kidding? It's the second largest country. And there's all these consumers. China's a, con a continent of whatever we did, 1.3 billion people. They have done whatever you think of, of their, their governance system, which I don't think much, but they have moved a quarter million people away from an agrarian society in the cities with the same buying partners and ambitions that we do. And their goal is to move another half million. There's only 350 million of us in the United States. If you include Mexico and Canada, we're still not a half billion people. Now there's a billion and a half in China, billion, roughly a billion three in India, billion three in Africa, another billion in Latin America. That's four billion new potential consumers we want to have access to. So telling China that we don't want to engage with them is cutting off our nose despite our face. Now, what I don't quarrel with is the Trump administration doing the same thing that we did in the Obama administration and the Bush administration and Clinton and others is saying to China, no country's benefited more from trade liberalization since China was um, allowed to join the World Trade Organization now some 20 years ago. No country's benefited from global trade more than China. But with that benefit comes a responsibility to play by the rules. And it isn't just enough for you to ship all of your goods to the United States and Europe. You've got to open up your market. China got probably 70% of the way there, but clearly they like selling more than they like buying. And they have an economy that is rooted in protecting their political establishment. All of China's goals are related to maintaining the status quo and being able to make a compelling argument to their people that opposed to what they, as opposed to what we see all of these other in, Arab, in the Arab economies in Middle East and North Africa, our system works. You can trust us. Forget this democracy. We're going to liberalize enough. You're going to have the ability to feed your family, buy a car, buy a house, have a more urban lifestyle, but we're going to do it in the context of a, of a, of a communist-controlled, semi-liberalized economy. For them, that works. They can't get where they're going, where they want to go without our help. So we are right to hold them accountable, that they cannot copy, imitate what we do. That's that. that I, I hate that old saying now. They're used to, when we were kids that imitation's the sincerest form of flattery. Imitation is theft. You're stealing my stuff. You're taking my, my, my deal. And in a world in which 
we are moving to an innovative economy, we have to protect that. So the Trump administration, like others, is absolutely correct to say to China, you've got to reform that. What I quarrel with is the way they're doing it, by slapping tariffs on everything from China. Because we learned the lesson 70 years ago, there's a little bit of the Great Depression. We learned the lesson 80 years ago that tariffs are a tax on you. If you take nothing else, remember those two things. 95% of the consumers live somewhere else. You pay tariffs, not the government. Tariffs are self-imposed taxes on consumption to say to you, we're going to make it so expensive for you to shop on eBay that you're going to have to get out of your bed and actually go to the store and buy it over here. And that's all that, that, that they're designed to do. It's not effective, particularly harmful for our farmers who bear the brunt of that. And so it remains to be seen how we find our way out of it. And my biggest fear is in the interim, China is finding other suppliers while this thing goes on. And uh, so China is problematic. We have to confront them, but I'd rather confront them, engage them, continue to open up their market. They're already the largest, I think, uh, market for U.S. agricultural exports. And I keep mentioning that. Agriculture is probably about 10, 15 percent of U.S. exports. We decidedly export more in what we call services and manufacturers goods, but no industry is more dependent on agriculture, on exports, than agriculture. Mainly because we're just so damn efficient at what we produce. We cannot consume everything we grow and raise. So we have to find new markets. And the easiest way I tell people to understand agriculture is go plant something in your backyard. And I know all you young people are now going, oh, I'm gonna grow my own stuff. Go start growing tomatoes. You spend all your weekend going up and down the neighborhood going, I got all these damn tomatoes. I can't eat them all. Do you want some? Well, it's the same thing in a business sense. So, you uh, you know you acknowledge clearly that uh, that there's that there's problems with Chinese behavior uh, that need to be confronted in some way. Um, but you seem to be saying we can do that with only carrot, no no stick. Uh, and you can do it with a stick. I mean, we sued. Look, our, the Obama administration sued China more than any previous administration, and I won every lawsuit. But it takes time, and it takes resources. And I would say the one thing I, that I'm most proud of when I was um, going through my confirmation when President Obama nominated me to be the U.S. trade rep, uh, one of the senators, Susan Collins from Maine, wonderfully polite, very gentle lady, looks at me and says, Mr. Ambassador, love your enthusiasm, but..." Just what is it in your experience that you think qualifies you to be U.S. trade representative? And I thought about it for a moment, and I do. I remember I said, Senator, a sense of urgency. And both Mike and I were privileged to work for U.S. senators years ago. It is a wonderful body. It's a deliberative body. But in the U.S. Senate, people champion the fact that they passed something after 15 years. And I told her, as a mayor, if I don't pick up your trash, if I don't figure out a way to fill the potholes, if I don't figure out a way to, to get the crime rate down, you know what? I'm not, I don't get to be mayor anymore. And when I came into office as U.S. Trade Rep, I'll give you a true example. We had a lawsuit against the European Union over them excluding U.S. beef and cattle, which is worth billions of dollars. This lawsuit had gone on for 14 years. I called in my staff, I said, how many of these ranchers do you think are still in business? After 14 years, this ain't Boeing. This ain't GE, these are family farms. You've gotta be able to solve problems and solve them sooner. Because particularly for small business, which are 90% of our exporters, they can't wait three, four years to get a resolution. So we, you do have to sue China. You do have to hold them accountable. But you also have to know your homework. Uh, you all are in business groups. You're gonna sit down and negotiate um, across the table for people to do business. You better spend your time knowing who's sitting across the table from you. Understand what motivates them. What's gonna move them to make a decision? How do they make a decision? The United States is a country that prides ourselves on speed and doing a deal. We're very commercial. We 
the rest of the world is familial. Henry Kissinger once observed when asked about how to negotiate with China, he says, never underestimate the challenge of sitting across the table from someone who measures time and dynasties. When you go to most countries, there's a reason the first thing they do is take you to meet their families. They want to get to know you. So anyway, you have to know who we're dealing with. And for China, and for many parts of Asia, even though it may just sound like it's a slogan, the ability to say things, to walk out of the room with both partners saying we got a good deal is critically important. That's not going to happen when you have a president who tweets all night long about how he rubs your nose in it. So previous administrations realize sometimes it's easier for China to make an agreement in the context of a global agreement. So when we sued China, we didn't sue China alone. We sued China with Canada, with Mexico, with Japan, with Europe, with Australia, with a number of other members of the WTO. And we did it in an environment in which China could say, we were doing this in the context of a global agreement. You can't care about who gets the credit when your concern is about protecting the interests of US innovative, US farmers, US workers. And so I think there is a way to do that. And secondly, is also realized China is furiously trying to catch up with us. It's why they are producing tens of millions of scientists and engineers every year. They're becoming a more creative class. Who do you think might be more persuasive with going to China and saying, it is critically important for you to protect our creative ideas, our intellectual property, Donald Trump or Jack Ma? So let's piggyback on the creative classes in China who have interests that are not that they're similar to ours and not care so much about being able to champion that we rub their nose in it, but find a way to get them where we need them to go. That helps them grow their economy, but also gives us the benefit of using our resources to be able to get there. And I'm not arguing that this is easy. This is a very, very difficult needle to thread, and as critical as I have been of this president, because I think he has no overarching philosophy, uh, the new president of China is decidedly more nationalist than his predecessor. And so, that th there could not be two more dissimilar personalities, I think, in terms of finding common ground than President Trump and President Xi. So let me, let me stay with this and, and just play a little bit more devil's advocate. Um, it's certainly true that U.S. consumers pay for tariffs on one level, but it's also true that, that, the, that the reduction in the, in the sales uh, of Chinese goods in the United States uh, seems to be having a significant economic impact on China, a negative impact, and uh, it is therefore potentially leverage for the United States to get some of these improvements on intellectual property and other issues uh, that everyone agrees are, are a real problem. So I guess the, my question is, isn't it okay for an American president to ask the American people uh, to sacrifice some measure of the cost of goods in order to win this sort of profoundly important issue of the protection of our intellectual property against the Chinese for the long term of our economic relationship? If you have a, a defined strategy to which you are going to adhere with guardrails on that to get us there, I would say yes, but in the case of this administration, we do not. I mean, in the approach we're taking, um, you, you kids are too young to remember Body Python. You know, we're just the two soldiers hopping around on the battlefield lopping parts off of each other. And at the end of the day, that, I just don't feel that good about that. And again, it ignores the reality. China has other options. And, and, and look, I'm not a gloom and doom person. I mean, the good thing, mayors at our core, uh, I think, are doers, are builders. We always believe there's a way to make that deal and do it because we have that, that sense of urgency uh, that we're going to get it done. But there are signs that this has been as harmful to our own economy than it is harming China. 
Um, if you look at, at a number of the communities the president said that he was helping, because we didn't just, if we were just focusing on China and really had a strategy with that, and we were consistent with that, then I would be all supportive of it. But at the same time, we picked a trade fight with Mexico, with Canada, with the European Union, with Korea, with every traditional ally that we had. And so on one hand, we said, oh, we're going to slap tariffs on cars under national security interests. Really? We've been buying cars from all around the world for 50 years, and now they're a national security threat, notwithstanding the fact the automotive industry is pretty smart and decided, you know what? It's more efficient to build cars where you're going to sell them. So those BMWs that you, that you buy, the BMW X Series, you know what? They're all made in the Southeast. Nine out of 10 of the Korean cars, the Kimi, uh, the Kias and the Hyundais that are bought in the United States are made in the United States. Mercedes-Benz has moved their entire M-Class production to the United States. Likewise, Ford is sitting there <laughs> looking at the fact the Chinese are buying cars faster than we can build them, so Ford is building cars in China. That's just the way the markets work. So while I think you could argue, you cannot argue with the proposition that you articulated, the execution of it does not lend itself to you believing that this president has a strategy versus what I call just a series of Twitter rants because it just doesn't seem to be that consistency. Having sat in a room and negotiated with China, the one thing I know, the only way we ever got them to move is whether it was Ron Kirk, U.S. Trade Rep sitting in the room, or Gary Locke, then Secretary of Commerce or U.S. Ambassador to China, or Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, or Secretary of State John Kerry, or Vice President Joe Biden, or President Barack Obama. China heard the same message from every one of us over and over again. There was no daylight. There was no inconsistency. There was no one day, yeah, you're going to do it. The next day, you're not going to do it. Because they can look for that to try to make a determination. Are we serious about it? Are we willing to stay with it, hold them accountable to get to the result we want? And more often than not, we were able to do that. That's what I find missing from the current administration strategy. I want to turn away from China and talk uh, uh, just uh, briefly uh, about uh, Brexit. Uh, if, in fact, um, uh, the, the Brexit uh, gets to its conclusion of some sort and the British are out of the EU, uh, what kind of process do you see for the negotiation of a bilateral trade agreement between the United States and the United Kingdom? If it's taken them three years to do something they said they wanted to do, how long do you think it's going to take us to negotiate the trade agreement? Now, we also proposed a trade agreement with the European Union. Here's the good news. We already have the largest commercial trade, I mean, commercial relationship with the European absent a trade agreement. Um, our challenge with negotiating a trade agreement with the European Union or in the, in, in the um, eventuation of a Brexit deal, the UK, in most cases, we are helping lift another country's standards up to our level. Uh, it's easier for Vietnam, Colombia, Panama, Korea to modernize, modernize, reform their laws. In many cases, if they can wrap it in this opportunity to be able to assess uh, the U.S. market. Both the United States, the United Kingdom, and the European Union have very advanced democracies, similar ideas on the rule of law, very entrenched regulatory regimes. The hardest thing for us is how to harmonize those. Uh, because the tariffs be between us are reasonably low. So most of what we could unlock in terms of any agreement with the United Kingdom or the European Union is making it easier to do business in terms of regulatory uh, uh, regimes, or as we call those cross-border uh, deficiencies. Uh, but the other thing, It'll depend on the flavor of the administration. Again, the, the mayor and me, the hardest lesson that I learned was I had to fight the same fight to get a no stereo system for the mayor's office that had been there 
since the building had been built 30 years before I was elected than to get authority to get half a billion dollars to do the biggest public works project we'd ever done. So if you gotta use the same capital net, you think you're gonna spend it on the half billion dollar opportunity and go get your own damn stereo system. So for me, um, the advantage of the Trans-Pacific Partnership was this was a chance to anchor us in a multi tens of billions of the dollar opportunity. We're gonna have to use that same discipline when we look at do we do a trade agreement with the United Kingdom, or do we go back and try to get back into the, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, or ideally do we do um, an agreement with the United Kingdom and the European Union similar to what we did in NAFTA and just do a three-party agreement. But first, Europe has to decide what they want to be. Uh, and just to, to, to throw another one, I know we said we'd move on this, away from this with China. I mean, if you think about it, China's biggest advantage over the United States and the European Union, not because they're smarter than we are, not because they're more industrious, but, and, and I want to be very careful because none of us would want to live under this regime. But China's greatest advantage on the rest of the world right now is they can make a damn decision. They're pretty efficient in decision making because there's no dissent. There's no, no equal rights. There's no eminent domain. When China says they're building a road, they're building a road. And when China shows up and says we need your property because there's going to be an airport here, then you pack and you go. I think that's pretty bad for individual rights. But their biggest advantage, they make a decision. They're one of the few governments in the world that when you read their five-year plan, they actually try to execute against that five-year plan. Democracy is great for making sure every one of us has a voice. Not so good in terms of stability because every four years we get a new president. So we get a new path and we get a new plan and we go on. But hopefully, Brexit will be resolved one way or the other. Then once we know what the legal structure is, we can more seriously think about what, how we would liberalize that commercial relationship. Last question for me and then we'll turn to the audience. Um, I want to talk about um, who you might want to be that next president. Um, there have been, uh, as we've talked about, there's, there's been a kind of a taboo in endorsing free trade. Not just using those lang that language, but even conceptually uh, in terms of the democratic primary process. Um, have you been advising any of the candidates uh, and trying to move the democratic uh, party position towards uh, a greater consideration of the benefits of trade? I, I, I have talked to a couple of the candidates, but being the pro-trade Democrat is, is being a unicorn in every sense of the word. And the worst thing I could do for the candidates that I want is to go out and say, ooh, I like this person because they're going to be a pro-trade Democrat. That's the easiest way to make sure that they don't survive the process. But more than that, the one thing I've always tried to do is just not be a single issue voter. And I get that. I know there are people that feel very strongly about choice, about Israel, about civil rights, about voting rights. What I want is someone that has the judgment, that has the wisdom, that has the deliberation of thought to take on the most difficult job in the world. Because um, the, the, the job of the President of the United States is incredibly, incredibly challenging. All the easy decisions are taken care of by the cabinet and the staff. So all the people who come see the President on any given day are coming to him with insolvable problems. And the people in line behind him or people in life that it's all over. And, and you are, in many cases, trying to make, make the least bad decision that you can make. So more than anything, I want to know how you process information, how you value dissent, how you go about the difficult job of making a decision, more than I want to know your pro trade pro-believing, and what I know. Because if you do that, if you're thoughtful, if you're deliberate, Tip. If you um, are, are a good listener, but not afraid um, of making a decision that might be challenged that's not necessarily perfect, then that's the kind of person that I want uh, to be as president. 
And I would say that right now, uh, I think it's very early in the process. Now, obviously, I believe Barack Obama was that kind of person. The thing that I admired most about him is what Bill Gates said. He wasn't afraid to make a decision. But he was a good listener. He made everyone in the room feel like they had, not just feel like they'd been heard, know they'd been heard, but then process that information, make the best decision that he could. But if we were sitting here in this time, before the 2008 campaign, not maybe a few of you, not many of you in this room would have thought Barack Obama was going to survive or even make it past Iowa. And in fairness to the Republicans, hell, in March, April, May of 2016, none of us thought Donald Trump would be president. Um, so the reality is we've got a long way to go. What has not changed is the anxiety of the working class in America about whether or not their kids are going to find a job. I think underlying uh, many of the problems, a lot of what we find so challenging in our society didn't start with Donald Trump. Uh, and the reality, I think that same anguish, anxiety among working class families is what led to Brexit. It's what led, it's what led to Trump's election. And that, and I'm 65 years old, but I believe our generation generally is worried that we're the first generation that can't look at our kids and say confidently what every other group of parents before us did, you're gonna have it better than me. And until we can solve that issue, it's gonna be easy for people to blame immigration, blame trade, blame the borders, blame somebody else for where your job's going. And, and that anxiety, I think, is most concentrated in those states where the decision on the presidency comes down to. Whoever articulates a vision for them that we're gonna have an economy that's fair, their kids gonna have a chance to have a life without being burdened with crippling student debt, I think is gonna be the next president. I wish I knew who that was right now. Um, but, but whoever that emerges at least on the Democratic side, I'm going to support. Okay, questions from the audience? Uh, Haley has a microphone, can you come around? I guess my question is about uh, multilateral trade agreements. And if you take uh, the formation of the European Union, that in essence was a multilateral trade agreement. However, uh, even the European Union today bursting at the seams. There are Eastern European countries that are very unhappy about certain restrictions that the EU puts on them. Their own governments don't have the necessary, uh, I guess, authority or powers to do what's best for their own people. They have to follow what the EU tells them. Also, Brexit comes into play. So my question is, in today's world where there's such, and I think, legitimately so, nationalistic fever amongst a bunch of nations. How do you deal with multilateral trade agreements when somebody is going to feel slighted, somebody is going to have an advantage based on their level of uh, development or sophistication? So how, if you can talk a little bit about how multilateral trade agreements can work in the atmosphere that the world is in today. Um, Thank you. First, tell, tell me your name and uh, what the oh, council or what Ajit. Um, I was trying to speak a little to that Ajit in my last question that I do think, and I don't want to, I, you know, y'all can tell I'm not, brevity is not my strength in <laughs> these things. Um, as a democracy, and I think an economy matures, finding the dividend of that democracy becomes more difficult. I mentioned that I'm 65 years old, so that means I was born. I'll make it easy for you. I was born in 1954, the year the Brown versus Board of Education was decided. I grew up in the segregated South. When I was born, my parents could not vote. They had to pay a poll tax. Uh, they had to take literacy tax. By the time I entered elementary school, 10 years later, Thurgood Marshall had to go back to the Supreme Court, and that's when we got the case that is known as with all deliberate speed when the Supreme Court said that. But 
when Lyndon Johnson became president, he passed Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, Fair Housing Laws, the, um, created the National Council. The dividend of all that stuff was immediate. And all of a sudden, black people, you couldn't keep black people from voting in this country because we've been denied that privilege for so long. Now, 50 years later, I can't tell you how frustrating it is to see people that go, eh, doesn't make a big difference. So the same thing in the European Union. Now that we've had this liberalization, now that we begin to see this global competition, it's real easy for someone to say, well, the reason you don't have a job is because we've got these open borders and we have globalization. And I would say, I think those as well-meaning as, as it was to sell the liberalization of trade around the principles of rationalizing um, the cost of manufacturing and goods produced, what we left out of that equation is what you said. The reality is some people are going to be hurt by this. And it isn't enough to say, oh, poor you, your job got displaced. And we need to build a better trade system that the workers benefit as much as the global um, uh, as the global companies, but we also need a much more uh, honest discussion about why so many jobs have been lost. It has nothing to do with trade, nothing to do with immigration, but the fact that as we innovate, as we become smarter, faster at what we do, 80% of the jobs lost in manufacturing in this country have been due to innovation and to the introduction of machines and smarter machines and now artificial intelligence and how do you find work value in these advanced economies like the European Union and the United States. We can't solve that. I think we're going to continue to see that pressure. It is very complex. Um, I'm fascinated um, with an effort that Steve Case is leading and I don't know if you, you young people but you ought to Google it. It's called the Rise of the Rest. And they basically have mapped the United States and where the jobs were before the recession, where they are. Increasingly, all of the work is in eight or nine urban areas in the United States. And you overlay on that, 90% of the venture capital in the United States goes to Massachusetts, New York, and California. And beginning to understand we've got to think differently about where we invest in people, where we find ideas, where we create work. You give the largest number of people some sense of financial stability. I think that's the best anecdote to what, to what you articulate, not only here, but in the European Union. But that's not easy because we're just, we're shorthanding everything right now. It's either because globalization's unfair and immigrants writ large are taking your jobs versus how do we prepare the next generation for work in a highly evolved, innovative society. But look, I'm a mayor and a lawyer. I don't have to answer all this stuff. I mean, we're sitting here at the Temple Fox School of Business. Some of you smart people need to, to jump in here. Ron, where's my lawyer? Save me. <laughs> Anything else? Most of you presumably know who the World Trade Organization is. Um, I would back up and frame this um, in one way, because typically when I speak to non 
internationals, groups like yours. People only ask me three things. You know, where, where's the best place you went? Did you eat anything weird? What's it like to play golf with President Obama? Oh, does he cheat, which he does not. Um, but um, what I've learned from my experience broadly is trade rep. The most humbling thing is there's nothing to make you appreciate what you have to you leave home. Uh, and particularly going to the developed world that, that for all of our faults, and we've got lots of challenges in this country, the best thing about this country uh, is we are willing to hold a mirror up to our face and say we've got wards, we need to deal with them, try to work them out. And we are still the most admired country in the world because of the rule of law broadly and a sense that um, we still adhere to a freedom of choice and picking our leaders determine in your destiny. And we have this crazy thing called a public education system that most people from around the world, particularly from other countries, no matter what we think of our schools, when immigrants come here, there's a reason you go to most high school graduations in any big city in America and all the valedictorians have last names we can't pronounce because their parents believe in nothing else. You get an education, you can change the future of the world. With my law firm was privileged to have uh, the young girl from Pakistan who won the Nobel Prize. And I never forget, I just how I almost cried. And she reduced her whole sermon to one child, one book, one teacher can change the world. Now, you come back to the WTO, whether it's the Paris Accords, NATO, the G20, the G8, the World Trade Organization. The other thing we learned, and I hope it doesn't sound too, you know, xenophobic in my own way, unless the United States is there, facilitating, pushing, nothing happens. And while nobody believes that we're perfect in our execution of everything, the reason we are able to be the convener, the facilitator, the mover, is this general sense we play by the rules. And when we cease to play by the rules, then you have all these other illiberal sort of democracies around the world. When we create a loophole, that becomes a cavern for them to try out through. And now we're just back to the wild, wild west. And so what I see happening with the WTO is this president's approach to everything. As long as you agree with me, you're a great guy. You're the best guy. Temple's the best school in the world. Harley Davidson's are the best motorcycles in the world until you piss me off. And then the president of the United States is saying, those things suck, don't buy them. I wouldn't do them. It's bizarre. He does it with that, he's done it with Congress, doesn't get his way, his approach is to try to delegitimize the institution. And he's doing the same thing with the WTO because so much of what he did was unilateral. He didn't go through the process. And so he now says the process thinks and he's going to do it. When in the reality, we win probably 80%, maybe 90% of the cases. But, you know, when we misbehave, it's okay for the WTO to say to the United States, you've got to play by the same rules too. But what I'm concerned is by taking away that dispute settlement, that, that sort of law of the world of global trade, we now are going to enter a world in which we are putting at risk all of that innovation and all of that creativity because other countries may feel more emboldened to go ahead and appropriate that knowing that we don't have a dispute body that will hold them accountable. So at the end of the day, it's just one more foolhardy act. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't have to hold my tongue. I mean, this guy's just, he's a piece of work. But we're gonna pay, we're gonna pay the price. It's not, you know, it's, you have to laugh because you can't do, do anything else. But it's pretty, I think the, the consequences could be really, really harmful to U.S. exports and business. Time for one more. I see a hand here. Would you, <coughs> would you agree that... Just tell me. Yeah, just tell me who you are. Uh, Andy Sable, I used to be a member of the World Affairs Council. Would you agree that, because China is with their Belt and Road Initiative, working their way through 2025, using debt, becoming involved in other countries as a way, like you, you talked about, in their authoritarian manner, that by us pulling out of these organizations, we're leaving ourselves at a real disadvantage without having rule of law uh, uh, and our 
invites the part of these organizations to balance that out and to give organizations who might go along with the built the road less of a choice of where they're going to end up because they need the money for their projects for one thing and they're going to end up in a bad place but we're not going to be part of helping them make a better decision. Well as my father would say that wasn't a question it was an answer. Um, I mean it is. I mean you, you look you look in the paper today um, the ASEAN uh, ASEAN there are two sort of big um, economic confabs in the Asia Pacific. One is APEC, the Asia Pacific Economic Cooperative. We call it a cooperative, so we can include Taiwan and not within China. And that's roughly 21, 22 economies. And then there's a smaller subset called ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. To counter what the United States, Australia, Singapore were doing with the Trans-Pacific Partnership, China proposed its own regional economic cooperative they call RCEP. Without putting them at risk, most of those economies came to us and said, please don't leave us with the only economic option of China. Because separate everything else, the United States and China are the two biggest economies in the world. If you do business with the United States, there's a general sense you may not win, but you won't get wrong. You'll get a fair deal. We have this weird thing called the rule of law. You buy something from us that doesn't work, you call us, we'll either fix it, we'll make it right. You do business with China, we want to come in, we want to get your natural resources. China doesn't care about the environment. China doesn't care about labor laws. China doesn't care about protecting intellectual property. They just want a raw, powerful economic deal in which they can crush those economies. ASEAN announced today that they think they will conclude this RCEP with China next year because China is furiously trying to move into that vacuum that we created by pulling out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership. I'm just curious if any, just, I know there are some students here with a business school. Any, any questions, comments from, from any of the, the students? I mean, I don't want to force you to, but we are all campus. Uh, my name is Rohan. I'm not from business school. Um, I'm in the College of Science and Technology. Um, you spoke about how China is urbanizing with some of its like rural populations. I was wondering if some of the techniques that China is using we could use to urbanize some of the rural communities in the U.S. because I feel like a lot of the, as you were saying about the venture capitalists and the money's being invested in the very urban areas, how we need to reinvest in our rural areas because we do have a lot of talent and ideas there. Um, are, are there any ideas we can kind of transfer? You know, I think you can learn from anything. I think what we could most learn from China, most of the, the countries that measure time and dynasties is in terms of healthcare and wellness. Very, I mean, really, until I've been there, and I don't want to say it wrong, you got to go. What we consider rural is nothing compared to what's basically an agrarian society in parts of India, parts of China, many parts of Africa. I would say that the, the, for rural communities, the greatest lifeline to them has been technology and their internet, 5G to the degree we can extend that now, then people can live. You know, you work wherever you, your laptop is now. I mean, that's why so many young people work from home. You can telecommute. Commute. That's opening up lots of opportunities for our rural communities. But as a mayor, I'm frustrated that with both parties, we need a massive infrastructure bill, and not just in terms of highways, uh, but in terms of technology build, building that digital highway. I'm a part, I hope, um, if you have me back or if you remember anything, you'll say, God, that guy told us. One of the things I'm doing that's fun in my private life, um, and it's the Texans in this, but next year this time, we hope to break ground on the first high-speed rail, privately financed high-speed rail line in the United States between Dallas and Houston. And we're gonna use Japan's Czech technology, the Shinkansen, that'll make it, and, and our economic analysis Shown that it'll work because Dallas and Houston both are going to double in population. We're already the fourth and fifth largest economies in the U.S., but it shows the single biggest beneficiaries. We're going to have one stop. It's going to be the rural community between Dallas and Houston where we stop because now those kids don't have to move to the big city. They're going to be able to get on a train and be in Dallas and Houston in 30 or 
40 minutes every day. So there's so we know the answers to this. If you'll go back to my previous comment, I think what frustrates you nationally, all of us, they're, they're, these problems are not unsolvable. It's the frustrating, can we get just Congress to do the stuff we all agree on? Pass a damn infrastructure bill. Pass a clean, why are we arguing about climate change? You know, why are we suing California? You know, we, 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 the automotive industry is not going to start making clean cars. You know why we're going to drive electric cars? Because there's 400 million in people in China who are going to be buying cars, and China's got to clean up their air. And we're all going to be driving something non-fuel gasoline power within the next 20 to 30 years. But we should, we should be investing in education. We should be lowering the cost of higher education and business schools for America. We should be investing in historically black colleges and universities. China, India, Africa, Brazil can afford to be ambivalent about educating their young people. Because when you're dealing with a universe of a billion, that means you're only going to have two to three hundred million scientists and engineers. When you're the United States with 350 million people, you cannot afford to live with the reality that half of black and Hispanic boys and girls that enter the third grade don't grow, don't graduate from high school. How are we going to compete with six billion new competitors when we're ambivalent about educating our own people? So I feel that way about urban America. I feel that way about rural America. Um, we've just got to find the wherewithal to do things that work. So my plea to all of you who come out is make sure you know, where America works, thank God, is still in our cities and states, in spite of Washington. And so don't think of public service as a dirty word. I want you to do well. I want you to come out of the temple. I want you to be right. But I also want you to stay in God, engaged. You have to vote. You have to be willing to consider public service one of the most honorable callings. And we can't be afraid of being engaged with the world. So you all are very kind. You're ridiculously polite. Thank you for having me here at Dean. Thanks for being here.